as we have talked about before, um, you know, George Washington has entered a decade of, of transformation where, you know, looking towards this 200th anniversary in 2021, you know, we have a goal of nothing less than being thought of as one of the most admired and respected universities in the world. And given all that's happening at this great university on campus, in the capital that we all live in, all around the world, it's clearly a goal that we can achieve. Tonight's program, Global Challenges and Opportunities, is an example of how George Washington University provides a forum to discuss the vital and important topics of today. Tonight we have a chance to reflect on the challenges that we all face as a nation and the world and the tremendous opportunities ahead of us. We are in the middle of some of the greatest changes perhaps ever, but certainly some of the greatest changes in our lifetime. Financial structure, healthcare system, our place on the global stage. All are changing and evolving even as we sit here tonight. Times like these demand great leadership from our elected officials, and in my mind, there are few better leaders to address these issues than our good friend, my good friend, and GW alumnus, Senator Mark R. Warner. We are honored to have Mark not only as a GW alumnus and, and a real friend of the university, but someone who, you know, always remembers us at any opportunity where he can uh, that is helpful to all parties. Um, he's an alumnus who graduated in, with a degree in political science and was valedictorian of his class. It is well known that Mark actually worked on the Capitol while he was supposed to be going to class. <clears throat> but, you know, he very early on had this political disease, which was so important, um, I think, to what has driven him and is what really has made him go. But he wasn't just a politico who had no self-esteem outside of office. He was a leader in the cellular telephone industry. Um, he was a pioneer in creating businesses and jobs in America. He was involved in, you know, numerous, numerous startups that went on to be very important companies uh, throughout the, the, the country. And he used that as a base to really pursue the leadership that he's done in the United States. I think as many of you know, from 2002 to 2006, he was governor of Virginia, where he turned a record budget deficit into a surplus at a very difficult economic time. He focused on improving public education and expanding economic opportunity. And he brought 135,000 new jobs into Virginia during his four-year term. When he left office in 2006, Virginia was recognized as the nation's best managed state and best state for business. He was elected to the Senate in 2008 and there has served on banking, budget, commerce, and intelligence committees where he brings all of his experience to really try and make a difference. In 2011, in a very difficult time for our country, Senator Warner helped form the Senate's so-called Gang of Six, where three Democrats, three, and three Republicans worked really tirelessly to try and bring together some, you know, substantive, really important change uh, to try and really go at this, you know, record deficit that has been choking our, choking our country. And so with that, tonight, we not only have the opportunity to hear from Senator Warner, but we have our own Frank Sesno, who in many respects is our own in-house rock star that has, you know, really brought to us this ability to you know, bring subjects and, and bring his Emmy award-winning capability and his years covering the White House and his years being the Bureau Chief with CNN and now leading our, 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 uh, our media and public affairs school to, to really bring to this a conversation that, as I said before, hopefully will allow each of us to sort of get inside what's really happening about both the problems and the opportunities. And before I ask both to come up, if you'd come up, please, to a little round of applause. I would encourage everyone before we hear this very hokey video that came over from his office um, <laughs> and to uh, go online to the Daily Beast and in the Daily Beast while you're supposed to be paying attention to this conversation you'll see the real Mark Warner which we hope to see tonight and I'll just read from this this was a piece that just came out recently um, in politics as in business Mark Warner can be tireless and relentless in his pursuit of deals so last spring, while the, de while the Democratic Senator's suburban home was in the state of utter disorganization during a renovation project, Warner still found it the perfect time to invite a half a dozen of his Senate colleagues over for dinner. Quote, 
His house was a mess. There was a plastic all over the place, and we just meandered through the plastic to the kitchen, Senator, Senator Saxby, Saxby Shambliss recalled. His wife wasn't home, so he takes into the cooking, rolling up his sleeves, making salads, giving out orders, grilling steaks. So tonight, I hopefully you see him roll up his sleeves, maybe grill a few steaks, and tell us what really goes on in the Senate. <laughs>
for the, for the party could be a very destructive a prelude to the general election when whoever comes out, and people presume it's Romney, will have to come back to the center. Is that how you see it? Yeah, I think that's how you see it today, but you know, political prognostication in this country at this point lasts about two weeks, three months. We've had you know, how many different uh, assumptions that we're going to have Romney securing the nomination. Uh, one thing I do know is that historically, Republicans are much better about coming home to their, their nominee than Democrats are. And the fact that, particularly in terms of Mitt Romney, and we serve together as governors, I, I like and respect Mitt. Um, but the folks who are he's having the most trouble with are the most conservative. And the only thing that may disturb them more than Mitt Romney's so-called moderation is the prospects of a second Obama presidency. And, so, right. And when I, it comes down to that, if Romney does emerge from this, which is where the, the betting money still is, right? that he is still going to have a compelling narrative, a compelling case against the President of the United States, the President under whom unemployment has gone up, debt has gone up, deficit has gone up, and, and he presents himself much in your mold as the, the, the businessman who's created jobs. And he has a very strong case to make. The, the fact, though, Frank, is if you look at from where this President came in, with the House burning down, an unprecedented financial crisis, you know, first month, 750,000 jobs lost, the next couple of months like that. If you look at actually the numbers, you've seen since those first couple of months about 3.5 million jobs gained. You've actually seen the deficit start to move down, not nearly enough. And let me assure you that that still, is the, that still is the single biggest overhang. And I believe until and unless we get that resolved, it's almost become a proxy for whether our political institutions can function in the 21st century. I don't think we'll have any kind of agreement on the other major issues we confront. But I think at the end of the day, the, the president will be able to make a compelling case. But I think a good spirited debate on the issues, on the issues about debt and deficit, yeah. on the issues about how you grow jobs and frankly stay competitive. I just came back from India. Stay competitive in a global economy ought to be the frame of the debate, not some of the issues that are passing for debate right now. All right, so Russ, at the start of this thing, you know, talked about challenges and opportunities. Clearly for Obama, clearly for the country, the deficit is the challenge. Where's the opportunity in solving that? You were gang of well, six, listen, you got nowhere. I, I, uh, I've, I, I loved Russ's description that, you know, he did all this stuff and I kept thinking it wasn't horseshoes or hand grenades. Getting close wasn't enough. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't. You know, and it, it and you still is You beat your head against well, the wall. Well, I beat my head wall. against it, but here is the good out of this. We started with six, we ended up with 45 senators. We ended up with 100 members of the House, equally divided bipartisan. The facts on this are so overwhelming that anybody that spends more than a passing time on it, and even the super committee that in many ways was set up designed to fail, those, many of those members came to the conclusion near the end, oh my gosh, we've got to do this. You know, if you take away another, no other factoid, federal spending right now is at 25% of our GDP. That's an all-time high. Revenues are at 15% of our GDP. That's a 75-year low. Over the last 75 years, we've had a budget deficit, Democrat and Republican alike, every year but about five or six of those years. And the years that we had a either surplus or relative budget balance was when spending and revenues were between 19.5% and 20.5%. So this is not rocket science. This is not curing cancer or defeating communism. You got to bring your spend down and you got to find a way to rationally raise your revenues. And the point that I think where, where everyone here and the American public are ahead of the elected class is that this is going to require a trade-off on entitlement reform to make sure there actually is a Medicare program 50 years from now, tax reform that generates some additional revenues in a fairer and simpler way. And I think the American people are more than ready to do that. We just got to keep pushing it. And well, the, the polls, the polls actually show and the American people are somewhere between two-thirds and 75 percent behind some of these tough decisions, but they fall into total gridlock here. Why didn't your president, your Democrat president, seize your work, seize Simpson-Bowles, and run with it? Well, our work was simply an extension to Simpson-Bowles. And, and then there's where been, was your president? You know, and I think he made a mistake not taking that work. And honestly, in the first three months of 2011, going out and making the case about the problem and saying, here's one solution. If you got a better one, I'll take it. But the, the, the missed opportunity, I think, was that uh, we didn't build that case. If we think back to the last time that our country had similar problem, 
was back in the early 90s. And I think appropriately, Bill Clinton should get a lot of the credit, the Congress at that point. But the educator in chief during that time was Ross Perot. Yeah. You know, we, we actually needed a little bit of a Ross Perot with charts and graphs showing where the lines don't meet. And the relative, on, on a relative basis compared to what other governments are going through, what Greece is going through, Italy, even what the UK is going through, this should not be that heavy a uh, lift. You know, your, your president came to George Washington University, came to the Jack Morton Auditorium, we remember, for his big deficit speech. Simpson and Bowles were in the room. Why did not, why do you think he did not seize this and run with it? I think it was a missed opportunity. I, I will say this, when we had that. Have you told him that? I have shared, yes. <laughs> and, and he said? And he said, as appropriate, and what he said to me was when we came out with our Gang of Six plan in late July of last year, he endorsed it. The problem was at that point in time, that his endorsement, particularly in the House, probably cost us votes rather than helped us. Okay, I want and one of the challenges right now, and, and you know, there is blame to go around for everyone, but when you have, a, at this point, a majority of the majority in the House signing a pledge that says they're going to put in front of their pledge to the Constitution a pledge to, the, pledge to this gentleman, Grover Norquist, that under no circumstances will they, ra they raise revenues, I don't know how you make ends meet. So where's the opportunity here? How does this get solved? Well, the opportunity is we are putting Simpson Bowles into legislative language. There is going to Who's be a we? window. The, the gang of six, the, the horde of 45, or the army of 100, where, where this group is still working. Um, and we are hopefully, and I believe there may be an opportunity late spring, probably more after the election. But remember, this problem doesn't self-correct. And whether you are a fan of the president, whether you're a fan of Mitt Romney or Rick Santorum or Newt Gingrich, do you really want to saddle the president, the next president, with the first item coming out of the box raising the debt ceiling $3 trillion? They're going to hobble the next president, and that's the last thing we need to do. You're going to get an extension of the payroll tax? I think we'll get an extension of the payroll How tax. How bloody is that going to be? I, you know, it shouldn't be that hard, but that's an irrational world. I, I would argue, I, 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 is I your would. world? It's not, not my world. It's not the world I work in. The one thing I am afraid, you know, I think it is, uh, I wish that we would see, and because I am afraid that while the payroll tax holiday provides some short-term stimulus, it does take money from the, the Social Security Fund. You know, we're going to use for a pay-for for that probably things that will take 10 years of pay-fors for one year of, um, of benefit. And I would actually hope that it would, if the economy continues to improve, that it would automatically unwind so that taking it away doesn't get viewed at the end of the year as another tax increase. Um, so, you know, and I've, I think there may, you may see some things as we try to work through that in the next two weeks. Let me, let me change gears here a little bit. We can come back to politics, come back to budget, because I'm sure some of the questions are going to touch on that. We talk a lot about innovation. Uh, the university talks a lot about innovation. Um, I talk a lot about innovation, <laughs> because that's a, it's a great word, and it, and it, and it, and it means something. You're on, your subcommittees touch on Internet, aviation, innovation, exports. When you say the word innovation, what do you mean? What I mean in innovation are things that are going to transform the world, they're going to generate jobs, and create economic growth and wealth. And I would argue that in the last decade that we will actually look back and say, for the most part, it was a lost decade in terms of innovation. The this, only, was a, this was a lost This last decade. decade. The, the, the only place or the place where there was the most innovation was it quite honestly in financial engineering that created a financial house of cards that almost brought our whole economy coming, crumbling to the ground. We have seen a narrow scope of innovation Where? in a relatively uh, in small area. Social media, you know, the Googles, the Facebooks, the Twitters. But that's a relatively small scope. What we've not seen are the kind of expected innovation that we would have hoped for in life sciences, in aviation, in energy, in telecommunications. And there are things that we can do to spur that. Uh, for example, we've got legislation out there right now that would make it easier for startup companies to access capital, to go public, to start making sure that we change some of our crazy immigration policies where we no longer educate the best and brightest of the world and then send them home. 
encourage them to actually you know, staple that green card onto graduate degrees in STEM education. Somebody wants to start an, uh, a, um, uh, be an entrepreneur here in this country, allow them if they're going to create jobs here in America. You look at Northern Virginia, we've got a very rich, robust technology community. 30% of those entrepreneurs are foreign bone Americans. Very diverse. We've got to continue to do that. There are also some relatively low-hanging fruit. Uh, we were talking with Anish earlier in terms of granting more spectrum on telecommunications, reforming the FDA so it doesn't take twice as long in America as it takes in the EU to get drugs to market and de medical devices to market, spurring an energy policy that uh, even if you don't want to fight about global, global warming, clearly being dependent upon fossil fuels and foreign oil in particular makes no sense. But none of this is new. None, None of what of you said new, is new. The question is, is how, and a lot of this is policy. We've got this very interesting thing, and I know you've worked a lot on regulation. There's serious pushback on regulation. So at the same time that you're talking about the EPA moving forward, you're also <clears> talking <throat> about the EPA being the poster child for government overreach. Well, re yeah, so how do you regulate here. to where you want to regulate, but l allow the innovation to take place nonetheless? Let me take them both. On innovation, I do think if we had a, a clearly articulated energy, life sciences, telecom, internet, I think there's things around composites and aviation, you know, a, a more comprehensive mm -hmm. innovation plan for our country that we could make that case. And then you need to make the, both the regulatory, the kind of crowdsourcing opportunities for fundraising and immigration policies to help supplement that. On regulation, I do think there is a frame. I think that the, this notion that suddenly regulation has exponentially increased with this president are just plain flat wrong. The facts don't go along with that. But I do think there is an accumulation of regulation over the last 25 years that ends up starting to be a marginal cost, a too high a marginal cost on a lot of things we do. Let's look at where the incentives are. There is no incentive in place right now for anybody inside an agency ever to go back and eliminate agency uh, regulations that have outlived their usefulness. Right. The only incentives are to add more because if you add more, you're rewarded with additional staff and additional money. So there's an example, and I hate to say we can actually borrow from the Brits on this. Uh, the, the top line idea is kind of a regulatory pay-go that says for at least a short period of time to clear out some of the old regulations. Think about any business that wouldn't have cleared out some of its business practices. For a short period of time, if you add additional regulation, and I do think regulations play a terribly important role. I was part of the financial reform package. Some of it good, some of it not so good, but it, there needed to be new rules. If you add new regulations, you then have to put an incentive in place at the agency level to go back and at least eliminate some of equal, perhaps not equal size, but some percentage size to take them away. And the Brits, just to, again to kind of finish my point here, I know. I thought you were kind of more a PBS guy where I actually got the whole answer out instead of just a sound bite. Well, if I, was, know, a PBS guy, I'd if I was a PBS guy, I'd ask the question and leave. But, uh, <laughs> but, you know, but, but uh, you know, the Brits have actually done this. They call it one in, one out, and there are lessons we can learn. So there is a, and, and, and one other point, because you know, we'll keep moving along. Right. The thing that is, that is um, you know, to give hope, because you can all look at all this stuff half empty, half full, and I hope we'll come back to America's on its competitiveness. But there, are, there is a lot more, particularly in the Senate, members who are as frustrated as all of you, as I am, with the notion that with our country hemorrhaging red ink, with countries moving ahead, that suddenly how it's okay to take a year off because there's an election cycle. So Lamar Alexander, senator from Tennessee, and I were hosting dinners, 20 at a time, senators, you know, trying to say, how do we even when your house is under trust? renovation? Even when the house is under renovation, how do you build that trust to kind of say, it's time to put party in front of or country in front of party? And they're, to the credit, you know, one thing about politicians, like them or hate them, and we know where folks are most part, they are self-aware enough to realize that 90% of Americans think we're dysfunctional at this point, and I'm part of that 90%. So let's. You know, and, and the time will be over this next year to see whether that kind of, not the outliers, not the folks who appear on the television the most, but the folks who actually want to try to legislate to get stuff done, will step up. We, we, we don't have very much time because we have to be out of here so that we can, uh, thank you, uh, um, let folks here move on to other things. But before I go to these questions, you mentioned going to India. So you talk about our innovation. India is innovating. There are a billion people there who are innovating. China's innovating. There are a billion, two, three people there who are innovating. 
I mean, we're up against fierce competition. The question, is, the question isn't only can we innovate, the question is also can we innovate fast enough? Right. And you talk about American competitiveness. So what was your conclusion, what you saw in India? India is a remarkable country. I'm chair of the U.S. India Caucus. It's not my first time I've been there. But, you know, India is going through a bit of the same challenges. This notion uh, that we are all only dysfunctional and half empty and everybody else is racing ahead, you know, India is cutting back their growth projections. They have, the Singh government has political paralysis as well. We constantly got the answer, well, we got to wait for our elections before we can give you an answer on whether we're going to have a civilian nuclear deal right. and deal with things that they promised us years before and other a host of issues. Uh, China, the same thing. China's costs continue to rise. Manufacturing in America becomes dramatically more competitive on most projections. And I am a big fan of the Clint Eastwood commercial at the, the Super Bowl the other day. You know, American manufacturing vis-a-vis -vis China and India, those cost differentials are getting smaller. Um, you know, the rest of the world is not waiting on us. But the one thing is we kind of, kind of get dour all the time. You know, this is not the first time that we faced massive budget shortfalls, a looking like that our traditional industries were falling behind, and there was going to be the emergence of this Asian nation that was going to eat our lunch. This was exactly the scenario that was playing out in 89, 90, 91. It was just Japan instead of Japan. China. Japan what Inc. America did is, that, you know, we did something that was viewed as hard at the time, but on a relative basis was not that hard, got our balance sheet in order, and through telecommunications, internet innovation, things that our universities, which are still the greatest creator of intellectual capital in the world, American universities top any other institution or any other country anywhere, that still is a great asset. So We've quickly, where, where's the opportunity in this competition? In competition, Where's the opportunity, do you see it, in the next decade? I still think if I had to pick, you know, it's hard for me as a former telecom guy to say this, but if I was talking to these students and saying which, cat, which area would I look, I think there are going to be more jobs and wealth created in the energy sector over the next 25 years in the world than any other sector. Right. There's the most unmatch of production and needs, and you don't even need to get to the very real threat of climate So that change. takes me right to the question that we got from, from uh, John Richardson out there who says he'd like to hear more about your legislative work on renewable energy and cross-aisle implications. In other words, can you get it done? Can it work in Washington? So if that's where you're seeing the opportunity, he's asking, can you make it happen on the Hill? I think one of the great stories that someone needs to tell, and Frank, maybe you should help on this, is that you know, how we went from a 65 or 70 percent consensus in 2005, 2006, that climate change was real, coming, and threatening to the planet and the scientific evidence went up, and the American public's perception of this is a threat went dramatically down. I mean, it is a, you know, it's a great uh, story that I don't think the story has been fully written. I think you can still get an energy from the standpoint that you know, our dependence upon foreign-based fossil fuels makes absolutely no sense. Only country that, in effect, you know, the, the political applause line of what other country funds its enemies by buying you know, their, their products makes, you know, it has some truth to it. I do think there are things you can do short of major energy legislation around energy conservation, around if simply the Defense Department and our government started being a purchaser of cleaner uh, energy, not just renewables, cleaner energy, and I'm uh, all of the above, from nuclear to gas to oil to renewables, conservation, all of the above, but I think the, the government as a purchaser uh, can be a, help lead that effort, but I think, um, you know, I'm not sure we're going to get major energy reform for another year or so. I honestly don't so believe... So after the election. Yeah, not, but the thing is, I don't, I'm not sure, and this is kind of my more downside, because I think this budget overhang is kind of so fundamental. Until the parties can get out of their box and realize yeah, we've got to get our balance sheet in order, I'm not sure you're going to find the consensus on energy, education, health care, well, Lord knows on health care, not, but that we desperately need. Let's do this quickly. What can the next president do to cure gridlock in Congress? Well, one of the things you can do is, I think, is trying to spend a lot more time based on personal relationships. You know, the thing about politics really is, if you get to know somebody, if you bring that person over to your house that's a mess that my wife got, you know, my wife, she, went, she got really pissed off when she heard we had senators <laughs> over when the house was a mess. You know, you have a glass of wine with somebody and you have those big parties and you don't clean you know, up afterwards. You don't clean up you know. afterwards. You know, it's kind of hard the next day to go in and say, you know, 
You're a son of a gun. President Obama hasn't done that. So you think the next president should I be think doing you, that? I think have him over, a, I think, have him over regularly, I don't think turn it, is, it into it, a routine thing. I don't think this is a cure in itself. But you know, when I came to the Senate, one of the things that was fascinating was you kind of go around and meet all the other senators. Almost all new senators do this. And every, particularly all of the older senators, every one of them, didn't matter whether they were Democrat or Republican, all had a Ted Kennedy story. Oh, I remember Ted Kennedy got us together and we did this and we built trust and you know, we got something done and I didn't agree with him at all, but we did things. And it struck me after a couple months of this, you know, why in the heck aren't some of you guys who've still been here 30 years trying to fill in that role? So there are a group of newer senators in both parties who don't want to be there for 20 years to wait their turn in a world that, you know, doesn't allow 20 years to get, they are trying to build those relationships. So uh, I would hope on the positive note, stay tuned. We got a, a couple things, then we're going to wrap. When you were a student, and we have, how many students in the room? Where are you? Raise your hands. Look at that. When, when you were a student, you went up and you worked with Ribicoff and you worked with Grasso and you worked with Dodd up on the hill, right? And you were driven and presumably you were idealistic. Young people are so inundated with this gridlock and it's broken and it's not working and it's a terrible thing. What's your advice to them? What's your advice to the young people of this university? Can they be, should they be idealistic or is that just wasted energy? Well, the first piece of advice would be not to wear what I wore. I had a lime <laughs> green polyester suit. Oh, uh, the 70s were great. And I would ride my bike up the hill and get off and, um, you know, was it, uh, Churchill was right, you know, you can always count on the Americans to do the right thing after they've tried everything else. <laughs> you know, well, we've kind of tried everything else. And, and, the, and the, the circumstance that I'd say to the students is, you, know, you can say, oh, politics is a mess. Who wants to mess with it? I'm not going to do, do something. And you default then to the screamers who dominate right now. You default to the people who are the most fervent in belief on both ends of the political extreme. You default then to a group, that, particularly in the House right now, that doesn't view finding common ground. They find it as, as a liability rather than an asset. I mean, one of the things I'd, I'd like to say to some of these guys in the House, that some of the, and I understand the anger of the Tea Party, but this notion of no compromise, you know, they say they believe in the Constitution. Well, the, the genius of the founders was they set up a government that was slightly dysfunctional to start with. And it's become independent so House, much better. Independent Senate. <laughs> no, independent president where people have to work together. But you get politics only as good as what you demand. I mean, I was never more embarrassed to be in politics than in July and August of last year with the debt debacle. That was ugly. But, but... And we deserve a huge amount of the blame. But I was also, and I say this looking at this crowd here, never more disappointed in the business community and the other leadership of America who sat idly on the sidelines and never intervened. I started in the spring of last year to get every business organization in America to step up and demand of all of us or fire us all. And without exception, business organizations in this town and around the country all said, well, oh, Senator, I'd like to do that, but if we do that, we might make Chairman X mad or Senator Y mad. Until you all feel as invested in this as I feel and I think these students feel, then we're not going to get it done. You get politics as good as you deserve, and if we don't do this, you should fire us all. All of us, myself, myself included. Let me, uh, let me ask you a question about this university. You were a student here. You were a trustee here. You've seen it and you can think about it from the perspective of a business leader, a governor, a senator. You've had a lot of jobs. <laughs> when you think about the role that this university can and should play in this place at this time, 10, 20, 50 years from now, from those experiences you've had, what should the aspiration be? Well, let me also say, I, I see this, put one other caveat on this. You mentioned at our table that I also come back, I live in Virginia, but I come back, there's about 15 of us from uh, 
my class and the classes around us in the mid-70s who come back and have an annual reunion. Fifteen guys, we still play basketball, which is kind of an ugly thing, 57-year-old guys out <laughs> on the Smith Center floor. Thank you, Steve, for getting us a chance. Uh, <laughs> and not just me, but to see these other guys, and they live around the country, come back once a year, and to see the changes. I mean, GW used to have, the best asset GW had when I was here was its location. You know, and beyond the location, student life, the quality of the, the, the facilities, you know, we had good professors, but the other things were pretty B level. You walk around this university now, and there's nothing grade B about it. You know, the facilities are world class. You know, you hear time and again about the new faculty, the, the recent Churchill announcement, all these things that are happening. There's a sense of energy here. And what the university can do, and I, and I applaud the university for trying to carve out a role in, in research. But the other asset that you can be is this is a location to be a convener. Right. A convener around politics, around policy, around finance, around the arts. I think that's an area that this, the university could even build more upon. You know, from the Kennedy Center to the Smithsonian, we've got world-class arts here that is closer than and, and more concentrated than, than even New York. Um, so I think the, the you know, aspiration of this university should not be simply to be the best university in Washington, but should be to be one of the best universities in the country, and consequently, if you're one of those, you're one of the best in the world. And we can influence this, this discussion. I mean, that, that, that convening, I mean, we've seen that. That convening can influence what's happening in the paralyzed world of politics. And that, and that ability, you know, when, when President Knapp was going through all of the folks who've just been here in the last couple of days, you know, there are great universities elsewhere around. But the number of times they get a foreign minister from Turkey and a senator from state X or Y, you know, those are two or three times a year at other universities. These are a dozen times a week at GW. So for the students to get exposed to those kind of folks, to listen, to learn, to hook on to them, you know, the ability I had to go up and work uh, on Capitol Hill as somebody who kind of had the political bug to try it out, I would have never gotten that opportunity anywhere else. Um, so, uh, you know, the assets and possibilities of the place are unlimited. So we have two minutes and we end with Mark Warner's predictions. Okay? Prediction. Is this the lightning round? This is the lightning round. <laughs> who emerges when as the Republican nominee? Any doubt in your mind? Romney, March 17th. Okay. <laughs> Romney v. Obama. Before you answer that, predict unemployment in June. Unemployment in June will not be much lower than 8.3 because I think the economy will continue to improve and more people will go back into the workforce, which will mean the number won't go down. So but Obama I think the sense of improvement will continue. So Obama v. Reagan. Obama, Obama, v. <laughs> Reagan. Obama v. Romney. Frank, don't show your age uh, there. I'm wandering here. Uh, Obama v. Uh, I think, we're, I think uh, the president wins. Big? Small? I think it'll be tight, but I think the president wins. House? Flip of the coin. Think the Democrats have a chance? I think they got a chance. I think you still got to give the odds to the Republicans. Pelosi, too? And I'd love to share all this with you, but nice to see that camera down there. <laughs> <laughs> and the Senate? You know, if you look at it on the numbers side, you'd say the odds are the Republican. If you look at it race by race, as I know you have, I'll take my odds on the, the Democrats keeping their majority by a slim margin. And Virginia, how's it go? Tim Kaine wins. Tim Kaine wins. And who wins presidentially? I think, I think the president, you know, the... An awful lot of the, the past to the president's election lead through Virginia. And again, whether for those of us in the Washington area, that actually, whether you again are for the president or uh, the Republican nominee, that's good because for years this region got ignored by presidential candidates because normally Maryland was Democratic, Virginia was Republican. So presidential candidates ignored both states. The fact that Virginia's in play enters to both. Last prediction Mark Warner for president. Frank, yeah, you know. 
I'm hoping I might be president of the class of 77. No, 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 no. President of the United States. You know the president we're talking about. You know, Frank, best value Are you add interested? I can, best value add I can make right now is if I can help get this budget solved. Spoken like a future presidential S candidate. Spoken like a, a president. Are you interested? You know, I thought about it in, in after being governor and spent a year kicking the tires um, on the race and, you know, promised my, and Frank, uh, our families know each other, our daughters know each other, you know, I would promised my wife and three daughters that we would have a family discussion before I decided. I spent a year looking around, folks here helped me in the, in the room, got to October of 06 and we had of that family discussion and the vote was four to one. Yeah. Against. Against. <laughs> yeah. The who, other thing, who was though, the one? No. Uh, the other thing was, um, you know, at some point, anybody that considers this, and and I think it's one of the challenges that that um, senators have, and I'm not saying this senator. I think any senator would have, because senators. I, mean, I remember the ad that Hillary had against Barack Obama. You know, who do you want answering the phone at three o'clock in the morning? No, no senator answers the phone at 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> you know, governors do in a smaller way. You know, it's they do. not a... But the scope of the challenges, you, know, you can agree or disagree with the policies of President Obama. But to think the challenges this man has faced in the last three years, financial crisis with when the question of whether the country would ever recover, an emerging threat that we still face in Iran that could destabilize the whole Middle East and the whole world. A whole series of popular revolutions that no one in the, in the foreign affairs community or anyone in the world predicted right. across the whole Arab world. The courage of this president and of all, the, all of the things that I think this president should get credit for, the courage to say, I'm going to send a team in to take out Osama bin Laden rather than sending a missile in, and the downsides that could have had to his presidency if that mission had failed. And those are kind of the macro things, but any day you pick up the, the amount of pressure anyone that serves in this job, so you can like him or hate him. The same thing with President Bush, let me be clear. But anyone who serves in that job, not only as Americans do we owe them respect for being president, but we owe them a level of respect for the enormous, enormous pressures they're under. That was a really great way to not answer the question. Well, uh, we will not my tuned. first rodeo, Frank. I know, no, no, not my, first, not my first shot at this. But we'll conclude simply by saying this. Um, you make us very proud. Uh, your commitment to public service and to what you do, your tireless work and butting your head to try to break this pathetic gridlock that we've got in this town, your commitment to the young people and to the mission of the university is what brings us to work every day and makes us so proud of what we do and of our alums, wherever they are, but especially uh, in a case like this. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. <laughs>